Thanks, mate. Good morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. We did a bit of a, uh, uh, a fun exercise or just a, <coughs> a, a remembrance with the earlier service. And I just got people to put up their hands if they were here five years ago, almost to the day, um, five years ago when uh, Vic and I started the LBC, our first round through. So when we started chapter one, paragraph one, just to get a show of hands of anybody that was here. My wife was here, Jay Grace were here, Rose Vic. Keith Emma, that's just about it. So if you've come since then, uh, we'll probably be finished in approximately another five years, but these guys who were here back then, you could grab them and just say, uh, tell me a story of God's grace because the growth of this church has seen and the fact that you're here and that you've come at some point through there, praise the Lord. And we do pray that in five years or so, when we finish it again, it would sort of be the same ratio, that the, 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 the people who are currently here would be about 5% of our current of our, of our then uh, attendance if the Lord would bless us with so many souls to be saved through Jesus' gospel. Amen. Amen. So turn with me to Romans chapter 6. <coughs> For the earlier service, we were looking forward to baptism and uh, walked through Romans 6 to prepare us. For us, we are looking back on the baptisms we just witnessed, and we are again being refreshed with the goodness of God's grace and what he says about baptism in what is, frankly, my favorite chapter in the Bible upon this topic of baptism. Romans chapter 6 is uh, uh, Paul's big answer to the questions that were thrown at him for his gospel preaching and gospel explanation. Look at Romans 6. We're going to be in verse 15 and following. Really, the guts of our time will be in 17 and 18. But this is what happened when Paul would preach the gospel. Paul would preach the gospel and then legalistic Jews over this side or maybe legalistic Christians over the other side. uh, In fact, the little Catholic and the little legalist that is resident in each one of us does the same thing. When Paul says the truth of the grace of God, uh, the, the legalistic part of us always wants to shout up and cry for a caveat, for, for a qualification. Right? Don't make God's grace that free. People will live in sin if you do that because Paul's gospel of grace was simply this, that you have sinned, Jesus has saved you, and has secured you in a grace-based relationship with God so that now, no matter what you do, no matter how often, how horrible, how iniquitous your sins, you can never lose the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Christ. In fact, he goes to say this at the end of chapter 5, the more you sin, the more grace you get. Amen. Oh, you're all Catholics, are you? You're all a bunch of legalists who need Romans 6. Paul would say, the more you sin, the more grace you get. You're forgiven no matter what. You got sin, God's got more grace. You're forgiven no matter what. It's in Jesus. Get over it. Deal with it. Your sin can't condemn you. It doesn't matter how much a Christian sins. If the question is their eternal life, your eternal life has nothing to do with your sin. It's because of Jesus. But I can tell you can, you're feeling it already. You know, the preacher needs to back that up by saying, oh, unless you sin real bad, then you'll go to hell. The preacher needs to back it up by saying, well, unless you sin X amount of times or each culture and legalistic church or cult will invent its own unforgivable sin and say, but if you do that, you're out. And Paul does no such thing. Paul doesn't let the legalists qualify, uh, uh, circumvent, truncate his gospel so that we're not offended. And the good news that Paul is answering is not Oh, it's okay when you're in Jesus. There's no form of life. There's no lifestyle. There's no requirements. There's no morals. It doesn't matter if you sin altogether. That's not his, that's not his reasoning as to why no matter how much you sin, you'll always have more grace. His reasoning is not because sinning doesn't matter and a Christian's life doesn't need to look a certain way. His reasoning is because the gospel is so much better than fragile. The reason you, as a Christian, should not sin and will not sin is not because your salvation is fragile and you need to put up a little red rope around your salvation of your own good works so that you don't knock it over and lose your salvation. That's not why you should not sin. You will not sin because you're an entirely different thing than you used to be. In other words, the reason the Christian doesn't sin is not because Paul caveats the gospel and says, oh, but if you're too bad, you'll go to hell. The reason the Christian lives a new life is because they have been born 
into a new existence. It's because they've received a new heart. In other words, the reason the Christian sins less is not because of the Christian. It's because of God doing something in you. Let's read the verse. Let's start with the question that is asked then in verse 15 and see Paul's double answer to the double, to the double question. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Two people are asking this question, you could imagine. The antinomian over here who wants to keep on sinning but go to heaven is saying, aren't we allowed to keep on sinning? More sin, more grace, not under the law so I can do whatever the heck I want. Isn't that part of the gospel? Isn't that an implication of the gospel? I, can just, I just get to sin and do whatever I want. And there's a legalist over here who says, well, if you preach the gospel that way, then people will keep on sinning and you'll just keep creating antinomians like we just saw. He wants to sin, you're giving him a license to do that, a, a, a blank check, a, a, a hall pass to keep on sinning because he's got grace. Paul says to both of them, you don't get how good the gospel is. You think sin stops because people are under law? Fool. You think sin doesn't matter because you're under grace? Fool. Here's how Paul answers it. What, are we, are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are a slave of the one to whom you obey? That's a normal human analogy. Yes, we understand that. In the spiritual realm, it's like this. You are either obedient to sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. May God bless this word in our midst this morning. This is Paul's dual answer. What, what am I allowed to sin now because I'm under grace? Well, hang on, you need to add the law so that people don't sin. Paul says, what's happened to you is not merely a blank check. What has happened to you is broken chains, new creation, power from God. When you think of the gospel truncatedly, like it's just a little, it's a little tag on the back of your shirt that says, let him into heaven no matter what. Let her into heaven no matter what. If that's all you think the gospel is, that's all that Jesus procure, procured for you on the cross, then that would make sense that you think you can go through your whole life continually sinning. If, if all you think is that you're going to heaven because Jesus died for you and you'll keep yourself righteous, then it makes sense that you would get worried that grace is proclaimed because people won't keep themselves righteous. Uh, again, you, you think the power lies in you and you affect your salvation. But Paul uses the language of slavery. He says, in this analogy, in this way of thinking, or in this true reality, not just a symbol, but a reality, deeper than any other human level of slavery and mastery and man-stealing and being sold at the market, deeper than that is the spiritual reality. And he says, if you understand the full breadth of the gospel, that the gospel is is more than just a free check and is more than just being retaught new standards. The gospel is that you used to belong to the one you obeyed and now you belong to Jesus having been set free from sin. That changes the question. Because the guy over on this side who wants to keep on sinning is really saying, can't I be a slave to sin which leads to death? Paul says, well, you may if you wish to die. If you want to go to hell, there be there might not be a Christian, then yes, you will continue to sin and claim grace as your free card. And he says, oh no, I want to sin, but not be a slave to sin and therefore not die. And Paul says that logic doesn't work. You've got his brand upon you. If you're serving him day in, day out, day in, he is your master. You will go where he wants you to go, which is hell. He says, no, no I want to serve sin, but not be a slave. Not an option. You're inventing a new reality which does not exist. You don't have the power to create that reality. If you sin continually, if you devote your life to sin, if you wish and desire and long for and love breaking God's law, you're a slave to sin. And no little get-out-of-jail-free card of hopefulness will save you from God's wrath on the last day. And, and, and if, 
On this side, we're thinking, well, doesn't the, don't, you, don't you need to threaten people that if they sin, they'll lose grace? No. No, because I'm telling them something better than that. Paul is saying, I'm not just threatening them that if they fail, they'll go to hell. They're not allowed to sin, otherwise they lose their salvation. No, I'm telling them I have a rock-solid, unblemishable, indestructible salvation in Jesus, and sin can't break that. But they will live a new life because they're not slaves to sin anymore. This is a lot deeper than a mere, than a mere single-layered, surface-level, inch-deep, plastered over the top salvation from Jesus. It's not merely that God sends his heralds throughout the world and writes this little simple, tiny two-page book called the Bible or something. And really the message of Jesus is merely this, pray a prayer, say the chant, sign your name in your Bible, do what, go to church, just, just call yourself a Christian, nothing else matters. No, no, a million times no, by no means. If that's all the gospel is, then all of Paul, the objections that Paul is trying to answer stand. But if the gospel is that you are enslaved to sin, that you are being led towards death and hell as a punishment for your sin, that there were spiritual forces upon you, more than just your own flesh, yes, your flesh, but there were spiritual forces upon you which kept you blinded and in darkness under his power of Satan, and that therefore in Jesus, chains were broken, liberation declared, and then you changed status, changed ownership, changed nature given by God. If that happened, then the questions entirely change. So Paul's answer today is, or his, his sort of recap of the gospel taking root in someone's life is, verse 17 and 18. Let's read it again. Thanks be to God. That's really the main part of the sentence. Thanks be to God. Everything about this is God's doing. Everything about your salvation should uh, end up in and lead to glorif uh, glorifying God. I can say that of every Christian here. I can say it about the ba baptism candidates uh, now drying off in the sun. I can say that about you if you have been saved. Uh, you, uh, uh, as we're going to read here, you are a walking enfleshment of this passage. Or you're not a Christian. That's, that's how simple it is. Paul is going to give us the testimony of every single Christian in verse 17. Thanks be to God. And we should say that about all of our lives. Every one of us. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Thanks be to God. Amen? That's what Paul says. You, who he calls, who were once sins of, slaves of sin, that is, you, the ex-slaves, you, the ex-slaves, have become obedient from the heart. Now you're slaves of righteousness. And in the middle, what affected that change is this glorious reality. You were set free from sin. First of all, we're going to consider what it, what it really means that we were slaves of sin. It's good for every Christian to be reminded what our life was like before we came to Christ, as painful as it is. I'm even looking around the room right now, and I remember the, the sit-downs that you and I might have had as you were coming to the faith, and you were being saved, or as we interviewed uh, over uh, before baptism, or I'm looking at some of you and remembering the testimonies you gave when you were baptized, and you know this, I know that you know this, the, the vile, disgusting eternally crimson staining, filthy, vile sins that you and I committed before Christ. Those things that, that marked our entire life. Remember the things you wanted to devote your life to? Do you remember the things that you would do when no one was watching? Do you remember the things that your computer screen would be filled with going into your eyes and your soul? Do you remember the conversations you had? The things you did with your body to other people's bodies? The ways you spoke and what you uh, said to other people who bore the image of God. Do you remember that? Do you remember some of you were, 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 were deep, neck deep in, in paganism, new ageism, tarot cards, demonic, uh, dark magic? Some of you were in false forms of Christianity and cults and you blasphemed Christ daily by being there and worshipping this demonic teaching about him. Some of you have come from a kind of neo or 
a very ancient form of paganism in Buddhism or Hinduism or some other kind of uh, 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 false religion. Some of you have come up in a true church but not truly a part of the church and you have blasphemed God by taking his Lord's Supper and watching baptisms and hearing the songs and having the word read in your home and all the while it bounced off your stony, disgusting heart. Before Jesus, every single one of us was a slave to sin. We were, as opposed to what verse 17 says about the Christian, obedient from the heart. No, before Jesus Christ, we were disobedient from the heart. It was not just circumstantial uh, occurrences that, that led us into accidental whoopsies and mistakes. It was not just situational um, accidents that resulted in us doing something that we couldn't have known was bad. Yes, there was ignorant sins and presumptuous sins and a whole bunch of stuff. You didn't even know that you were sinning against God. But let's be very honest with the word of God. Before any of us, any of us came to Christ, we were intentionally disobedient from our heart. We loved to sin. And you know, as, we, as we sort of detail the sinfulness of each of us, before we came to Christ, before he saved us, we, we have to remind anybody who is offended by this, anybody who is, who is sort of reeling backwards, like, oh, I wasn't that bad. This guy was. Look at him. But she was. I remember, I remember her testimony. Piece of, piece of work. She, but not, not me. Anybody want to put your hand up and just get the, get the better version of the testimony? Anybody here pretty good before you can? Put your, I dare you to put your hand up. That'd be fun. There he is. So his problems was he used to... <laughs> The problem is with anybody that gets offended by that, with anybody that goes, oh, this, this sounds horrible. It's, yes, sinners really are like that. I'm, I'm thankful to God that I wasn't quite that bad. He, he saved me from mistakes and a few blemishes, and I wasn't perfect, and I wasn't perfect, but a wretch, a vile worm, a walking corpse, a, a rotten fruit. You ever bit into a rotten apple? Had, the, had, that, had that filthy black tar stuff drip over your hands and mouth? Your heart. Have maybe been walking and your foot just goes shin deep in animal droppings or filthy mud. That's your soul. Anybody who gets offended by that proves to us, yourself and to God right now, you are still that. You are still wretched. You are still guilty. You are still disobedient from the heart. If when God describes your heart, you say, nah. Like if the doctor sits you down and says, I'm so sorry, uh, you're blind. You can't see anything. This is our, this is our diagnosis. It, it wasn't a, a short-term uh, in, incident. Your, your eyes are now gone. And facing the corner over here, you say, you're wrong. Yeah, you're proving by, by everything you're doing right now that you are blind. And when we disagree with God's prognosis, diagnosis, and assessment of our souls, dead to sin, Dead, dead in sin, uh, slaves to sin, uh, willingly sinful, disobedient from the heart. You despise God's law. You love to sin. And if you could, you would do it more and more and more and more with impunity, with, without being punished. Uh, you, you just wish you could get away from the punishment that would come. That is every one of us before Christ. And I know, I know, of course, that's some of us right now. That's still you. The Bible describes your state. And if you've not been set free from sin, if not place your faith only in Jesus Christ, this is true of you. Slaves to sin, no matter how many times you go to church. Slaves to sin, no matter how many times you apologize. Slaves of sin, no matter how many prayers you pray. Slaves of sin, no matter how wishful your motives are to change. Slaves of sin, no matter how much you self-justify and give yourself excuses. Slaves of sin, regardless of whether anybody else thinks you're actually an exemplary human being and citizen. God says, slave of sin. Disobedient from our very heart. And this is the, the transformation that Paul then lists. So we were slaves to sin. Some of you are. Slaves to sin. We were disobedient from the heart. Look at what verse 17 says, though. This is the change he's seen. This is what Paul has heard of and knows is true about the Roman Christians he's writing to. 
This is what I know is true of su- such, a, such a multitude here at this church. And this is what is true for all of God's born-again saints throughout history. Thanks be to God. You who used to be slaves of sin, willingly disobedient from your heart, from your deepest nature. You loved sin, despised God, what philosophy could never do and other religions could never enact. God has now done. And I'm looking at you. I'm hearing your testimonies. I'm sitting down with you. I'm hearing uh, from, from, from uh, other the messengers about the church of Rome. I'm, I'm no, now you're obedient from the heart. What has happened here? Verse 17, look at it. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching you were com- to which you were committed. This is the transforming, powerful work of God that he can take somebody sinful and not just forgive them, not just justify them and say, Jesus lived for you, his righteousness is yours now, you'll make it to heaven no matter what. That's true. The gospel is not that it's less true than that. No, you need to stay righteous. You need to be good to make it. The gospel is more than that justified by faith alone in Christ and transformed, transferred from a kingdom of darkness, freed from a life of slavery to sin so that Paul can look at a Christian and say, you're obedient. You're obedient, not perfectly. No one's perfectly obedient. You're obedient and there is disobedience to repent of and there are changes you need to make. But as I see by the Spirit into your heart, I see that you are obedient from the heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Something has happened to you which no religion, no Bible reading, no law, no threatenings of hell could ever do, which is that God has done in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has given you a new heart that not only desires but can actually do obedience to God's law. This is the amazing transformation. We we could say... If you want to look at, if you want to behold, if you want to come into your eyeball the beauties and the power of a distant star, you cannot look at it straight. It's either too close, it will burn you, or too far away to be able to behold it. But you can look at the glory of the power of a distant star if you look into a telescope. It brings that glory into a tangible, visible, uh, compatible way of viewing it. And we could also say that the glory of the power of God, the transforming, creating power of God, who spoke the universe into existence and had energy to do a trillion more, that God, we cannot behold with the naked eye. And if we're, you're already looking him face to face, it's too late, you're dead. If, if we want to look at the powerful, creating, life-giving power of God, where do you look? You look into the life of a Christian. And in the life of the Christian, there is such a transformation that everybody with spiritual eyes and ears can look at that and say, wow, only God's power could have enacted this. There's lots of people who are are obedient on the surface. There's a lot of people who are obedient despite their heart. Maybe these are the kids raised up in Christian homes. Maybe this is you coming to Christianity, trying to change and better your life. And you're, you're trying to conform your life to God's word, but it's not from your heart. But the reality of obedience coming up out of your heart, that you have new eyes to see God's glory, of new ears to hear his commands, new joy in obedience, that, that is only done by God. It is right that Paul gives him the thanks. There is, however, a very important point that Paul makes in verse 18. In fact, we kind of need to... As the Greek comes into the English, sometimes the ordering of words, if you stick to the Greek, can confuse the English. I just want to make it a little bit more simple for us. Paul does not say, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient. And by your obedience, been set free from sin. Not what Paul says. The ordering of the phrases and the commas make, and the verses, 17, 18, may confuse us a little bit, but verse 18 belongs in the middle of verse 17 according to the actual grammar of Paul's words. Here's what he says. You who were once slaves to sin have been set free from sin, now are slaves of righteousness, therefore you are obedient from the heart. 
So, so this is true. As I look at you, I'm not giving you glory, it's thanks to God. I'm not giving you praise. I know what you're like. Come on. You know what I'm like. Come on. We, 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 no, don't, don't, don't worry that I'm praising you or giving you any kind of glory. Yet it is true that as a creation of God, you bear his mark. So we can say this. You who are slaves of sin, I now see obedient people. I now see people giving their lives and their time to give to the church, serve other people, win the lost, and glorify God. Do you know how much of a joy that is for somebody like Paul? How much of a joy that is for someone like me as a pastor, giving my life to, to preach out the word of God and trust him that will bring about fruit? And there we all are. There's there so many of us now. Lives transformed. Ex-drug uh, abusers now living for Jesus. Ex-pagans now serving Jesus. Ex-drinkers and uh, addicts and, and abusers and violent people and thieves and fornicators and adulterers now serving Jesus from the new heart that he gave them. It's amazing. You, you are evidence of God. You know, there's, there's two great evidences of a creator in this world. The creation itself, Romans tells us, the creation itself screams out that there's a creator. And the new creation, the Christian, is evidence of the power of God at work in those who believe. You are, I can look at you and say with Paul, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin are now obedient to God from the heart. What an effect. But that is a result of the primary work that Jesus did. The fact that you are now obedient from the heart The fact that you are now living out a life for Jesus with this new power that he's given you is not the cause of, but the result of God's primary act of salvation. So again, Paul does not say, I'm so glad that you former slaves of sin have become obedient to the heart and then you're set free from sin. He says, I thank God that you who were once slaves of sin have been set free from sin and therefore are obedient from the heart. Set free from sin, set free from slavery. There's a great uh, historical example that we might uh, look to as uh, uh, in the 1820s, there was a missionary. His name was David Jones, not the shop guy, not not the retailer, David Jones, the missionary for Jesus to Madagascar among the uh, Manganalese. But I'm going to stuff that up, so I'm just going to say Madagascar people. And he went there in the 1820s and uh, part of his job, part of his treaty, part of his agreement to get the the, the British fleet to drop him off as a missionary onto this closed island was that the king said, uh, the royalty had said, his governors had said, you can go as a missionary if you convince their king to give up the act of slave trading. That was part of his job. And that was part of his primary works there as a missionary. He would, he would preach the gospel full-time soon, but one of his first jobs was to meet with the king, negotiate a treaty, offer the contract from the, from the monarchy of England and have him sign it, then publish freedom. And, and he labored at this for months. The, uh, the, the, the British governor who, had, who had, had visited the island to try and enact this treaty previously had gone back on his word and tricked the Madagascar king, and therefore he was weary, once bitten, twice shy. He didn't trust the English. Through praying and laboring and and arguing and debating and pleading, they were sent home one day with the promise, you will have your answer by morning. They went home, James Hardy, David Jones, and they were praying, God, please, please end this practice on this island from the king downward. End this practice of people stealing each other from other tribes, children, young boys, men, Stop this practice of legally stealing people, rushing down to the shores and selling their souls, selling their lives off to the slave traders. Majority of them were, uh, uh, were Arabs coming down and, and stealing them and buying them and going back up to their lands. Some of them were French, but the English practice had been outlawed empire-wide. They were praying, God, please end this practice. And by morning, there was a, a messenger sent from King Ramada. And he came and he knocked on the hut and the the brothers, the British brothers came out, hopeful, hopeful, hopeful. And he held out the piece of paper and said, the king has signed your treaty. And the joy that exploded in their heart. They they, they set about to start telling people, but they warned, no, you stop, the king will announce it. At that point, I would get kind of suspicious. Will he though? The king has attested to the fact that man-stealing and selling is the bedrock of the economy of this pagan island of Madagascar. Will he actually stop it? Or will he just tell us that he did and go back on his word? 
And before long and before their suspicions and doubts could set in, the cannons of the palace were set off in large announcement, uh, which was their way of saying something is changing. And the heralds of the king were sent out onto the street corners to proclaim, to proclaim, to proclaim, slave trading is ended in this kingdom. This is what David Jones says about that day. He says, the messenger came and said, the treaty shall be ratified this day. The moment arrived when the welfare of millions was to be now decided and liberated. The proclamation was published and received with joy by the common people. The British flag was unfurled and freedom, freedom from slavery and freedom from the stain of slave dealing was hailed as a gift of the British nation. As the cannons boomed and the king's heralds announced the end of the traffic of slaves, scenes of wild joy met our eyes. The the, the British flag was up there with the Madagascar flag and it was being hoisted in front of the palace amid signs of enthusiasm in the masses. The slave dealers who had fought tooth and nail against this treaty prudently and wisely kept out of the way as the people and former slaves danced for joy. Now the prospect of being sold into slavery for debt or having their children stolen and torn away from them and sent to the coast for being sold had been banished forever. The horrible horror and terror of having your children stripped from your hands in the field or you just thrown into a bag and sold to some Arabians to be taken to a desert far away. This fear was taken away because the king had declared an end of slave trade. Therefore, we have this image, this, this analogy, this joy and this, uh, this, this, this freedom that comes to us in Jesus that we can see the, the gospel is like this. That, that it is not that the slaves who are in cages and boxes and chains, it is not... That David Jones, with the king, came to them and said, if you really live free, if you really try to liberate yourselves, then you can be free. That's religion. That's self-made, man-made philosophy and religion that says to a person, if you become obedient from the heart, then you'll be set free from sin. The gospel is just the other way round. The king himself comes as a herald and says to you, You are now set free from sin because of what I have done and the authority with which I declare the treaty. You are set free from sin. Now, as a result of the freedom declared, the breaking of chains, the opening of cages, now and only now, can there be people who live free from their slavery? And this is how it is in Jesus Christ. Charles Wesley wrote that great song, Long... uh, 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 How can it be that I should gain? He says, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a life-giving ray, and I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? This is the reality of the gospel that Paul is saying over every baptized Christian, over every person who has faith in Jesus, even if you just put your faith in Jesus four or five seconds ago. Do you know what's true about you now? That Jesus, by coming into the world, by by refraining from sin his entire life, infancy up through to adulthood, never gave in to sin. Therefore, he showed himself stronger than the bonds of sin and snapped the chains that held the human race fast under God's judgment. Jesus went to the grave, uh, sorry, went to the cross. And on the cross, he he received the great weight of all of our sin. He was swallowed up by the great dragon of sin, swallowed into its belly. He was consumed with the weight of sin, not his own. He was consumed with our sin, chained up with our sin as Samson with chains. He was bound 
for us and in our place. But by his perfect offering of his life, he destroyed those chains. He broke those chains. He slashed the gut and belly of the dragon and walked back out in his resurrection to proclaim that anybody, therefore, who is fast bound in sin, but hears that the king is is publishing a herald of liberty and freedom, if you call and say, me, please, I want salvation. I want freedom. I want liberty. I want out of this slavery. If you merely call on the name of the Lord Jesus, if you merely trust his promise, if you merely believe that he died for you, he lived for you, he can save you, he can transform you, he died for you, if you believe that, you will be, you will be freed from your chains. They will be broken. And it will be true of you what Paul has said. You who were once slaves of sin have been set free from sin And now you are slaves of righteousness and obedient from the heart to the standard to which you were committed. Three applications. Some people are here trying to be, uh, no, you are disobedient and you are disobedient from your heart. You know yourself a sinner. You know that maybe not right now for an hour and a half at church, but every other part of your life, you're just living in your sin. You don't care about God's law. You wish to be free of all of this judgment talk, and you enjoy yourself. You are disobedient from the deepest parts of your heart. God's word to you is repent. Repent while you still have time and breath in your lungs, because when you expire, your sin will catch up, and it will condemn you in an eternal hell. Repent. Some of you, however, are coming along to church. Maybe you've heard a few good things about Jesus and God's word and you've seen the law and and you understand sort of the basis of what might be called Western morality. And you say, I can do that. I can fix that. I I don't like being so caught up in all of these self-destructive ways. And Pastor Jordan Peterson said that I could help myself and self-help. And you read some philosophy and maybe some Marcus Aurelius and now you've understood, ah, I I can really help myself now. Some psychology and psychiatry and therapy has helped me. I meditate now. I can do better. I must do better. And to you, you need to hear, there is no laboring or striving that you can do to liberate yourself from the slavery you're in. The only thing that can break the chains is faith in Jesus Christ. We sing that song this morning. Weary, working, burdened one. You who are trying to be obedient, it's not coming from the heart. You're not truly born again or saved yet. Weary, working, burdened one, wherefore toil you so? That is, why are you toiling like you are? Cease your doing. All was done ever long ago. Till to Jesus' work you cling by a simple faith... Doing is a deadly thing. But by his work, we're saved. The the person striving, trying to become obedient to release yourself from hell is the child in a cage with chains around the neck and you're scratching with all the energy you have left to try and dig through a hard steel floor and it will kill you. You will die before you get free. But trust in Jesus and his finished work and the chains snap and the doors swing open into liberation. And some of us, are truly born again. And our heart has become a new heart which has obedience within it. We have God's law written on our heart now. We are truly Christians, but you are, you are tolerating far too much disobedience. You're giving some credit to the opponents of the gospel who say, if you give them all grace, they'll just keep sinning. Now the word of the Lord calls you to consistency, to obedience, to integrity, And to embody this verse, this text, this promise of God, this praise to Jesus and this doxology which says that you, having been set free from sin, must not go back and lick at the insides of the cages trying to get some of your old morsels. You must not go back to the chains and wrap them around your neck again and play prisoner in those cells. You are free from sin. Live like it. Be liberated, my friend, in Jesus Christ's name. Let us pray in his name. Father God, we thank you for this promise which is wonderful which is glorious and which is entirely based on you and not us. Lord God, that's why it's such a permanent, effective, powerful promise is because it doesn't rely on us. You have borne with us in all of our sin. You were patient and merciful with us. You sent your son to die for us. You rose your son, our Savior Jesus, up from the grave and then you gave us the spirit who is the power of eternal life. Well, God, thank you that you 
broke our chains. You scratched the treaty. You signed the papers of our liberation. You declared good news of freedom from the slavery of sin. And therefore, no other or higher authority can rewrite condemnation against our name. Thank you, Lord God, for this wonderful promise, which is true in Jesus, applied by the Spirit. And now we read it in your word, and we ask that which is true for us, having been set free from sin, that which is true for us, that we are given a new heart which has obedience, would you make even more true and more evident in our lives? Lord God, would you lead us in your right way? Would you lead us to put sin to death? Would you lead us to rejoice in righteousness and care nothing for our fleeting feelings but pursue righteousness out of our new nature because by your grace and your grace alone, you have forgiven us and empowered us and committed us to a new standard of teaching. We pray these things, Lord God, that it would be true in our life and glorify your Son. We pray in his name. Amen.